Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about how to review your games. This is a very important skill to help in your journey to improvement. Now what I'm going to do is separate this video into low and high elo again like my previous vid and the cutoff we are going to make for this one is going to be gold and below is treated as low elo, platinum and above is treated as high elo. At the end of the day, ranked and skill level is on a spectrum and the relevance of these points that we were going to discuss will be the most pronounced at the extremes. So we're going to start off with low elo and I'm going to leave a graphic on the screen here to show the importance of the different points that you should be reviewing. So I believe that 50% of the time spent reviewing for low elo, you should be focusing on early game fundamentals, 40% of the time champion identity and 10% of the time exploring moments of discomfort. And of course we're going to go into each of these points on their own. So let's start off with the early game fundamentals point. This should be reviewing early laning phase almost exclusively the first eight minutes of the game. So you should be looking at wave states, laning, making sure that you have these fundamentals down. You need to be able to build a solid foundation and understanding these fundamentals will be half of the battle for you in low elo. So do you have an idea of what wave state you generally want? Do you know how to achieve that wave state? Are you communicating your intent for the wave state? Is it happening consistently? For the laning fundamental, are you getting chunked a lot? And why do you think that may be? Are you using your spells at deliberate times? Or are you just throwing them out randomly and running out of mana? Are you towing that line between danger and safety, being in a pressuring mindset, dictating the pace of the game? You want to break this up in chunks. So you're not going to just review the entire early game section. Maybe you want to work on wave states initially to really figure out what wave state is suited to you. I recommend checking out my support fundamentals wave states video for help on this. You should be able to have a rough idea of where you are on these fundamentals and then to work on them appropriately. We're going to have a quick look at an example here and this is a review from one of my students, Mr. DeBeef. He is in bronze and he is playing Nautilus. And so we should already be thinking about what type of wave states we want. As a Nautilus, you know, we're an engager, we have kill threat, we want to be able to eventually set up a freeze. And now, of course, we want to hit level two first. We want to do something with that level two spike, you know, eventually crash the wave and then set up a freeze so that we have a long lane to be able to kill. And so we can just have a quick look at what happens here. And so we're going to get to lane. We're going to get level two first, but we're not going to use our level two spike meaningfully, right? It's a huge spike for everyone. And then we hit level two and then we're not in a position to use it and we're not actively looking to use it. So this is something that he would review. And so we're going to move forwards a bit and now pay attention to the wave state. And so we're shoving. We're going to want to crash this and set up that bounce, but we don't crash it fast enough. And then the wave half crashes and then a minion dies and then Jin is going to be hitting more. And then we're just sitting here. And so we're never really setting up that freeze for that long lane state to be able to use our champion. So we, we get a pick that's not really important here. And so all through this time, this wave is just stuck by their tower and we're not really setting up that freeze. And so then we'd want to explore why. Why is this happening? What could we have done to secure that wave state? Maybe this wave over here, we need to be spam pinging our gin to back off. Or maybe even the wave before, we needed to shove faster. We need to be out here, we need to be auto attacking. You can start to explore and try to find some solutions. As long as you're thinking about the right thing, then you're in a good spot. Now these early game fundamentals are so important for low elo because you need to have a stable foundation to build off of. I'm going to steal Coach Curtis's analogy here. League is like chess. It's not like tennis or soccer or other traditional sports. The state of the game depends immensely on what happens early. Everyone studies openings in chess, right? But the later the game goes on, the variance is so insanely high that it's basically impossible to structure it at all. Sure, there are famous end games in chess, but to replicate those is just not really in your control at all. It's the same for League. The first 14 minutes, even the first eight minutes can set yourself up for success. There are less variables. You can work to replicate it. Understanding its importance goes a long way too, especially when you're in low elo, to understand the snowball nature of the game. High elo generally has a better grasp of this concept and of the fundamentals. Moving on to champion identity. What does your champion want to achieve early? What is your champion strong and weak in? Maybe you're playing Nautilus who is notoriously strong early, but you didn't build a significant advantage. You'd want to explore that. What led to that and what can you do to change that? Maybe you are playing an enchanter and you failed to scale up and you can explore that as well. This will help you to think critically about the game and build your game knowledge repertoire as well, which is important for low elo. 
so this is a student of mine. Um, she is in silver and we are talking a lot about the war of attrition in our sessions. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, this is a strategy to slowly bleed out the opponent and achieve maximum pressure with a ranged champion. I recommend checking out my War of Attrition video, which can give you a more in-depth explanation. And so what happened in this game is that she failed to meaningfully achieve the War of Attrition, and she noticed that, and then we went on to explore what we could do to change it and why it happened. So what happens here is they're getting the shove, the poke, the pressure advantage. Here is a wave that uh, Silver is getting to shove. We're going to speed it up. And then the next wave they get to shove, get some poke down, they're pressuring us. And then the next wave they have access to again, and so we're not really making any inroads. And so there are a lot of potential solutions, right? I don't want to just go outright and say all of them. It's great to have a think about this. But how can we achieve Zyra's identity of being able to poke out and being able to win the lane? A potential solution could be preventing them from accessing our wave so easily, right? We could be right up here, look into order, look into queue. But then once we allow Sever access to this wave, then uh, it's too late. Another thing could be, you know, we could use our E to trade for her E as we did. And then there's going to be a huge window to be able to punish. And so then we can really be exploring for an all in on this window instead of just allowing the lane to kind of play out and not abusing that cooldown. There are so many potential options, but it is important for Zyra's identity, right? And so you have that game knowledge of Zyra or an enchanter or a mage. They want to be able to shove, poke and pressure. It's not happening. It is a kind of a clash of your expectation of reality and then you want to go and explore that. You're expecting to shove, you're not, how come? And so your champion identity is going to be inextricably tied to wave states. It could be about, you know, your strength at level one or level two or level three. It could be how a trade goes. You should have a general expectation of what your champion wants to achieve. Then jump in review and make sure that it is happening consistently. Moving on to discomfort. So this is moments of discomfort. You're going to remember and learn better from exploring emotional experiences that you had in game. We're going to remain in the early game for now, but you can have a, a look at moments in the mid to late that made you feel uncomfortable. But this will include poor trades, you know, failures of plays, especially deaths. None of us like dying. It's important to have a look at deaths. But without the game knowledge to identify why a death happened, you might be led to false conclusions. And so this is why I don't really want to emphasize the point of discomfort too much. This is only going to be taking up 10% of your review time. But this is a tool that can potentially help to build your game knowledge. And so what's going to happen in this example, this is the uh, bronze student again. There's going to be an awkward trade and that could be a moment of discomfort, right? Like why did we just get chunked out so heavily? Could this be due to us being weak or could this be due to us hanging around too long? Or could it be for any number of factors at play? And then reviewing a death, so maybe we misassess the kill threat we have, or maybe we panicked, or whatever reason. It might be easy for me to say to just, you know, find out why you died. Again, if you don't have the game knowledge, you can't really form healthy conclusions. And so I'd rather that low elo players approach review with an element of humility, find concepts from coaches or content creators or high elo players. It's also going to be a lot about just getting the reps and playing the games, experiencing situations for yourself. And maybe eventually you can start identifying trends. Have a crack, be a sponge, absorb as much information as you can, and don't jump to conclusions too quickly. Moving on to reviewing in high elo, and this is going to be plat plus, but it's going to be the most relevant the higher elo that you get. Here is a graphic on screen for the most important factors that should go into your reviews for high elo. 50% of your time spent reviewing should be putting out small fires, 30% reviewing fights, and 20% thinking about blueprints. Starting with small fires, this is investigating small points that pop up or draw your attention. This could be anything from rune setup to itemization, to summoner tracking, to unexpected ganks, to optimizing vision control or denial, to losing a matchup that you think you should win, anything that challenges your ideas and beliefs about the game, to small optimizations that you may notice. Any moments that cause you to be uncomfortable, frustrated, confused, etc., so this is taking the discomfort point for low elo and kind of running with it. These could even be small points in the early or the mid to late support fundamentals, although you should have an understanding of the fundamentals conceptually and have muscle memory by now. So it should only be a small fire and only like revisiting and polishing up on those fundamentals. 
So these small fires, these are 1% that are going to add up to reach the next level in high ELO. You just want to chip away at them continuously, put them out, build on your game knowledge. And since you're high ELO, you should have enough game knowledge to make some conclusions. So let's have a look at this example of a small fire that I wanted to put out in one of my games. So what happened early on in this lane is I didn't really find a window to find an impactful R into Q. I didn't want to Q when Milio used his shield and I didn't really, uh, wasn't really able to find a great angle to splash onto them. And so I wasn't able to achieve early poke, which is what she really wants to do. And so I can have a think about maybe I need to adjust how I approach this lane matchup. You know, maybe Milio having two E's makes it really hard for me to land meaningful poke. Maybe I should approach the lane from Jinx's side and just match wherever Jinx is so that I can find an RQ. Maybe I can even start in lane. And so when they enter lane, I can find that two-man RQ and maybe they can really change the outcome of the lane. So that was the first small fire and what I decided on was that I should probably just start in lane and let my Hecarim um, clear down towards us, have a really good 2v2 state in the lane to have prior to be able to collapse on the Kindred who might invade our Hecarim. But matching Jinx could have been a solution as well. And then we're just going to speed it up a little bit. There's going to be another small fire. And so what's going to happen in the near future is that we're going to get ganked. And then we're going to have to blow our sums. Both of us have to flash away. And so obviously this is not ideal. And I want to figure out how I can avoid the situation in the future. And so a lot of different factors could play into this equation, right? We could have started in lane, got a better TV2 state and let our jungler clear down towards us so that we can play with freedom because we want to punish lane. We could have avoided the chunk that we sustained, so both of us are a little bit chunked. And just trying to figure out how to avoid the awkward trade that led to us getting chunked. Um, we could also have a think about how to ward appropriately for this, because you can see my body language here, right? I am respecting Kindred being around here, and I could have communicated more clearly that my Lucian should not just blindly face check the river here. I don't want this, and I didn't communicate it appropriately, so I should have been pinging more. We can also go back and toggle vision and have a look at what their jungler ended up doing. And so this is why using the spectator client to review a game can be helpful because you can get this information that would normally not be available to you. And so there was a ward over here in the river, but that was just to cover Kindred jumping over the pit. Because champions like Kindred, like Nidalee, like maybe Graves, they want to invade, especially a Hecarim, and use their mobility. And so what happens is this ward was too shallow and then Kindred just gets to wrap around here, doesn't get spotted over here, wraps around, doesn't get spotted again, too shallow. So at the end of the day, there are a lot of potential solutions and I just want to make sure that I find a solution that I'm happy with moving forwards. Moving on to fights, this is taking up 30% of the time in your reviews and this is for throughout the game. Fights that went unexpectedly poorly and why? Or even if you knew that you misplayed the fight, if you missed skill shots, if you used too many resources like summoners or ults when you didn't need to. Exploring, optimizing, reviewing fights is very important. And there could be many factors playing into a fight going uh, more poorly than expected. Maybe someone was chunked before the fight. Uh, maybe teammates uh, were missing crucial cooldowns. Maybe you failed to communicate your intent. Maybe you were too slow or you missed skill shots or you misassessed lane prio or you could have been greedier and gotten two kills. There are just so many. This is practically impossible to perfect and it has infinite permutations. It is always going to be relevant to work on. You are always going to want to have a look at them and figure out what you should have done better. So here's an example from my Tarm game, and what has been happening is that we have just been outscaled. We have a Pantheon, who is not going to be great in a front-to-back teamfight, and I am playing Tarm, who has been heavily outscaled by the Milio here. And so I'm looking to pounce on any opportunity that presents itself that is away from their uh, front-to-back 5v5. And so I'm hovering on the side here. I'm staying in fog. I notice Kaisa by herself, and she ease forward, so then I'm just going to pull the trigger. I, I'm saying this is this is the time to go. If we can one-shot the ADC, then maybe we can regain some semblance of control in this game. However, what happens? Just gonna speed it up a little bit as she ends up surviving. And then the fight is just over and the game is pretty much lost. And so I want to figure out, did I make appropriate decisions? Was there something that happened that was in my control and I can optimize, or was it just largely out of my control? And so looking back on it, I land my W, I land my Q. I use my ignite, my body language and my intent is fully uh, indexed in towards trying to kill this Kaiser. And what ends up happening, why the fight ended up going so horribly, even though we started the fight by blowing the ADC's flash and ult and getting a huge chunk, is because my ADC flashes over the wall and then just gets one shot. So this is probably largely out of my control. I'm happy with the decisions I made on a micro and a macro sense. 
what I could have maybe done is moved around this way to, you know, kind of organize myself in more of a front to back, but I was really indexing onto trying to kill this Kaiser and I can't control if my ADC decides to tumble and flash over a wall and die. And so I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm going to move past this after like five seconds, 10 seconds of looking at it. So for this point, I really want to emphasize just getting the reps in. It doesn't matter how niche a circumstance might look, you are always going to be able to form patterns and take value out of the review more than you expect. It's not like I've been in this specific 5v5 scenario before, but I was comfortable in assessing that I wanted to avoid the front to back because I have game knowledge about Tarn, game knowledge about Pantheon, just understanding the map state, being in a lot of situations and reviewing them. Moving on to blueprints, taking up about 20% of your time in reviews. What should your blueprints have been this game? Do your decisions reflect this? And when I say blueprints, I'm talking about structures and plans that are not necessarily dependent on the state of the game. How do you expect your comp to play out? How do you expect your lane to play out? How do you expect mid lane to play out, etc.? In a nutshell, this is the comps support fundamental. I'm going to link that in the description below for you to check out if you'd like. Because a lot of the time, especially at the highest level of play, you don't have much room for making sloppy decisions. And there are many potential blueprints that you could have. Maybe you understand what your comp wants to do and what the enemy comp wants to do. So you avoid 3v3 skirmishes versus them, or you want to inject volatility around your mid jungle because you understand that they want to snowball and fight. Or you prevent the enemy from 5v5 front to backing in the mid to late game. There are so many variables for this as well, and it requires a lot of reps. So let's just start talking about this example. We are versus Cog Lulu. They have a very greedy setup with heal and ghost, and obviously they're going to be scaling much better than the Jin and the Bard. I also understand that my Syndra really wants to be played around immobile mages. If they are given the space and the freedom to dominate 1v1, then they are going to flourish. And so I've been pretty much camping around mid, ensuring that my mid laner has the vision and the backup, because Syndra is so vulnerable to the Wukong and the Lissandra. And so with all of that being said, I want to ha I want to play around mid. Now the situation where the blueprint went wrong is that we went for a Herald play. I used a Roam Timer. We have perfect information of the enemy support and the enemy mid and the enemy jungle all being around this uh, Herald fight and I don't call it off. And the reason that I really don't want this Herald fight is because Wukong and Lissandra are six and they can just one shot my Syndra. My Syndra won't really be able to function in this fight very well. Also, I'm not level six, Lulu's level six. And so this is just not a really good idea. And so this fight went about as well as possible, and we still end up losing the fight. And so this was a big um, emotional moment for me that I really wanted to tackle in the review. And there are several solutions to this. I don't really want to go in depth. That's not really the point of this video. But at the end of the day, this was a blueprints issue. I want to wrap up this video with some final thoughts. Seeing your mistakes is going to suck. No one said reviewing was going to be easy, otherwise everyone would do it. You want to overcome the pain and the cringe towards your play and your mistakes. It is so empowering. Once you can watch your replays and just be studying the game separate from your ego, have no emotional involvement in the game, just try to figure out what should happen. What you could even do is distance yourself from the champion initially. What should Bard have done here instead of what should I have done here? Physically writing down the learning objectives or the takeaway points has helped me a lot and it is very useful. You don't want to write every thought that comes across your mind and just write an essay. But physically making the words is going to stick in your mind more. And this, I mean like pen and paper, not necessarily typing it out. Time management, learn to move on from what you are reviewing. You can easily spend 15 minutes looking at one fight. It's not going to be worth your time for the most part. You will learn to get more efficient the more you review. You're going to make your job of reviewing easier if you test your limits, you push the envelope, you make mistakes, and you provide yourself with learning opportunities. If we think back to my karma getting ganked example, if I was just sitting under my tower the whole time, then I would take no learning out of that VOD. It's not a race to improve. It's about the journey. It's about the long term, slowly building up knowledge and trusting that results will follow with time. The more you get in your own head, the less improvement you'll notice. The best way to reach your goals is not to dwell and compare to your goal constantly. It's to just do. In terms of point of view versus spectator reviews, I always use Spectator for collecting game info, you know, items, waves, enemy locations, wards, etc. Point of view can be useful to see your clicks and your camera movement, but it is not necessary. There is a little bit of personal preference here, so that's fine. Reviewing your games versus reviewing pro games. I firmly believe in reviewing your games over pros. Your games are going to play out so differently from pros, it's hard or even dangerous to try to replicate. Pro games can be used for combos and for fights and maybe a little bit of laning phase, but it should be mainly entertainment in my opinion. You want to see your gameplay, improve your play, be a better version of yourself from yesterday. 
build up that knowledge and that skill slowly but surely. Although I will say the higher elo you get, the more you can take away from the highest level of play and the less dangerous it becomes. Just be careful not to dwell on the mistakes during the game. You can solve the problems and figure it out afterwards. In game, stay focused on the task at hand. And we're going to wrap it up with just quickly talking about what I do at the moment. So I put out small fires almost exclusively. I feel like I very rarely have knowledge gaps. I barely ever get confused, which you'd hope from a longtime challenger and support coach. I've built that knowledge through extensive reflection and reviews. I've experienced the solutions. I've gone through the pain and the reflection. And so I don't really need to dwell on points longer than, you know, five to 10 seconds nowadays. For me, it's a lot about execution of the concepts that I know. It's about muscle memory, about mentality. And I also have strong emotional reactions to mistakes or discomfort, uh, which makes it easy for me to remember them for the post game. I hope you took something away from this video. If I were to just neatly summarize it, for low elo, put in the reps, seek out concepts, and for high elo, put out those small fires. Next up for my South Island trip, I was still in Queenstown, and this is me taking the gondola lift up to the Ben Lamond track start. At the top here, there is you know a restaurant and some cool tourist activities that you can do. Off to the side here, we can see a bunch of paragliders. They were always, you know, coming up and down throughout the day. We walk through the spooky little forest to get towards the start of the track, and then we emerge on the other side. Just wanted to show this pretty lake with mountains in the background. And here, this is, you know, near the top. This was the rest of the track towards the actual peak of the track. Some great views here, of course. And this was at the top. There was a very long, arduous climb just great scenery. I still get goosebumps thinking back to this day. I really want to go back here and do this walk again. Just surreal mountain scenery over here. And there's even a little lake tucked between the mountains, which I thought was really cool. And you can see some ice on the ground there as well. So we were climbing quite high and you were even in the clouds at the end of the hike. There was something poetic about being in the clouds after a hike, which was quite rewarding and special. This is me at the top pre-moustache era with um, epic sweaty patches from my backpack from the hike. Thanks for watching. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed. Big thank you to all of my Patreons over here. I really couldn't do this without you. Um, the links for coaching, for Patreon, for my School of Support Discord server, for socials, they're all going to be linked in the description below. Any and all support is greatly appreciated.